real pleasure to welcome you to this demonstration on behalf of the World Federation of Haemophilia. In particular, on behalf of the Laboratory Sciences Committee, my, my name is Steve Kitchen, I'm a laboratory scientist, I'm a member of the Laboratory Sciences Committee. Our current chair is uh, Dr. Sukesh Nair in India. He's also had a major uh, input into this uh, demonstration. So it's our intention to make a demonstration related to APTT testing. Because as you know, APTT is a, a pretty crucial part of our initial investigations in relation to patients with potential bleeding disorders. For the purposes of the demonstration, we'll be working in the water bath and we'll be working with manual technique. And that's because we recognize that many of us have quite different automation, semi-automated, fully automated analyzers in our laboratories. And, and our intention was really to talk about the principles, the kind of pattern of results which are obtained in APTT and, and, and really some of the ways to interpret these results and to try and do something which you can take and make use of when you're working in your own centres. Actually, I think it's essential for all hemostasis laboratories to have available a water bath like this. It's particularly useful to control the thawing conditions for frozen samples. Many of us will perform tests on frozen patient samples from time to time. I imagine many of you will do the same. And I think it's important then to follow careful thawing conditions. We should thaw plasmas for three to five minutes in the water bath. We should not thaw at room temperature, otherwise we risk uh, cryoprecipitation and, and, and loss of some of the important proteins. So, so I think we all need a water bath. It's also particularly useful if we make use of frozen control materials. You know that controls are a really important part of our testing and, and we'll be discussing those in a moment. It's perfectly acceptable to use uh, freeze-dried, lyophilized control materials. This is common practice in, in, in many laboratories and, and that's fine, they work extremely well. But I think there are also advantages to uh, frozen control materials and, and subject to the local ethics conditions, actually we can make use of frozen controls uh, also to take account of uh, the, the costs and, and, and to make savings. In the UK, for example, we have the Human Tissue Act, which permits the use of residual plasma. When we've completed our diagnostic testing, any residual plasma we're allowed to make use of for quality control purposes. And that's particularly useful because it means we can harvest residual samples, plasmas from patients, and we can use this to construct control materials. And I think there are a number of advantages to this. An obvious one is cost, of course. But, but I think in addition to that, uh, such a sample, because it's a patient material, it's closer in its properties to patient samples. And, and I'm sure that's an advantage because it, it's difficult to keep control materials with the same properties when we have to go through freeze-drying lyophilization. So, so I think there are a number of advantages. When it comes to the water bath, um, it's important that we use calibrated thermometers. The temperature is crucial. All of the testing we're doing and the thawing is, is of course influenced by the temperature. We'll be running some manual APTT tests in a moment. And, and in this case, the water baths that used should be carefully controlled and the temperature should be recorded. We, we, we use uh, a, a system in, in my lab with uh, where there's a, a bottle of fluid uh, and you can see the wire links to the device and, and the device is, monitors the temperature. So we've got a record of that and I think that's important so that we know that we're working within the limits. And of course we want to work at 37 degrees and as we are at the moment, um, but we have some tolerance and we, we should be using a water bath where we're able to keep that controlled within plus or minus one degree at the most and, and, and then I think we're, on, we're in a, an appropriate area for testing. We'll be doing some tests with two different APTT reagents and these two reagents are different. They have different phospholipid concentrations and we'll talk more about that in a moment as we begin the testing. They also have different activators. And there is a growing interest and focus on the activators present in APTT reagents 
particularly as we're beginning to see uh, um, increased use of extended half-life products, factor eight and factor nine, in development and beginning to be used. And it's becoming clear that the activator in APT reagent can have an important influence on the results which we obtain, particularly when we use that reagent in a factor eight assay. So, so I think there is um, increasing interest. And we'll talk in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so about the way in which uh, the activator can have an impact on the results that we obtain. The full protocol or some comments related to APTT are contained in the World Federation of Haemophilia Laboratory Manual. This is a resource produced by the Laboratory Sciences Committee and I'm pleased to say it's available on the World Federation of Haemophilia website. I think you know the address www.wfh.org. There's a publications section and there are a number of I think useful publications available. It's possible to download the manual as a single document, but we recognize that people don't necessarily want all the sections. And so we've now set it up in such a way that uh, it's possible to download an individual section or sections. We also recognize that English language is not the first language, of course, WF, of all people interested in WFH, it's a, an international organization, as you know. And therefore, I'm also very pleased that we have available on the website translated versions in Spanish, it's been very popular, also in French, uh, in Russian, in Arabic, and in Chinese. And, and we'll, we'll keep monitoring in the future whether there is a need for all the versions. I'm aware that um, some local national member organizations have uh, made translations into other languages, and I think that's, that's um, a useful thing to do. Okay, so we'll press on now with some APTT testing. We'll be using two different reagents, and these have different phospholipids, different activators. We'll be running these tests in the water bath. So the first thing I need to do, once I've put the gloves on, first thing I need to do is to put out some APTT reagent into the water bath to be warming. And of course, when we move a reagent from a primary to a secondary vial, either, either in the water bath as we're now doing, or, or on an auto-analyzer, we have to pay attention to the fact that we may have altered the stability conditions. So we need to use the reagent during its period of stability in its secondary vial. And I think for an automated system, we should pay careful attention to the recommendations of the manufacturer. Just now we're working in the water bath. It's important to choose an appropriate secondary container. And for many plasmas and, and some reagents, we noticed that the reagents are less affected if they're moved into secondary containers comprising plastic. And, and, and sometimes there can be problems with some types of glass. So I'm gonna use plastic tubes on this occasion. Some activators are particulate. Kaolin in particular is a, a, a visible particulate activator. This particular reagent contains a very, very small micronized silica particles. And some particulate, particulate activators, particularly kaolin, will settle and sediment during storage. That's not such a problem with silica, but nevertheless, if, if we're moving into a secondary vial, we have to be sure that we've fully resuspended any, any activator before we put out the secondary vial. If we were working in the water bath now for two, three, four hours, then there is the potential at 37 for evaporation and that, and that can change the evaporation of the reagent, that can change the uh, performance and stability of the material. So we should cap the vials if the, if the material will be in the water bath for any length of time. And this can be done with uh, plastic lab film, for example. So we need to leave this in at 37. So the level of water is above the level of fluid in the tube, fully immersed so that it will come up to temperature. We know that plastic is uh, not quite so efficient a heat transfer as, as glass, so it will take a few minutes for this to reach 37 degrees. So we'll leave that to be warming. The secondary agent, as you know, I'm sure for an APTT is calcium chloride. 
there's no uh, absolute uh, agreement on which concentration should be used. However, the vast, vast majority of reagent manufacturers, the vast majority of laboratories, are using 25 millimolar calcium chloride. If you uh, maintain a stock solution at molar concentration, that's a 1 in 40 dilution in distilled water. This is the most frequently used uh, concentration. Uh, there are manufacturers who uh, recommend alternatives, at least one uses 20 millimolar for example. And I think you should follow the manufacturer's recommendation, the, the manufacturer of the APT reagent. But again the most frequent is 25 millimolar. So that's the concentration we'll be using just now. So again I need to make sure that we have a solution of calcium chloride also at operating temperature 37. So this will also go in the water bath now to be coming up to temperature. If this were an auto analyzer, same issue, we'd want the reagents to be on board the analyzer for sufficient time in, in order that they would reach the operating temperature on the, the platform of the analyzer. So this also goes in the water bath. I think whenever we're performing APTT reagents, uh, APTT tests, whenever we're performing APTT tests, it's really important to begin with a control. We have guidelines available to us, the WFH laboratory manual we've already mentioned, but also other national and international guidelines. And a common feature in all of those guidelines in relation to APTT is that we should test at least two levels of control. I think two levels is adequate. But there should be levels with uh, different results. We need a normal control, and that tells us that the method is under control in an important area, that we're able to obtain good results in normal samples. But of course, some of the key samples that we'll be testing are patients with abnormalities. We're interested in particular, of course, in bleeding disorders. So we want to be confident that our method is also working well when we're dealing with prolonged APTTs. So I think the second level of control should be effectively an abnormal in a critical area. So we've got some degree of prolongation. It's acceptable to use uh, lyophilized controls, uh, but, but I think there are some advantages also to uh, using frozen materials. It can, the properties of the control material should be as close as possible to patient samples. And if we use frozen controls, we have less potential to introduce changes. It's, it's ideal to begin with uh, patient samples for the abnormal, and, and this is why I think it's useful if uh, ethical rules in operation uh, allow us to harvest uh, residual plasma from, from patient samples. If we do this, then it's acceptable to make a series of small pools. Perhaps this is done on a series of different days, 20 mils today, 20 mils tomorrow, 20 mils over a series of days, and, and these can be deep frozen. They should be frozen at an appropriate temperature, and that really means at least minus 35, minus 50, minus 70. We should not be storing those materials deep frozen at minus 20. Particularly for APTT, we can begin to see changes during storage, and, and, and that can be a problem. So we need sufficiently low storage conditions. If we harvest on a series of days plasmas in this way, and, and we begin to build a large volume, but in separate 20, 30 mil aliquots, when we have sufficient material, these can all be thawed, pooled, and aliquotted. It's key, absolutely essential, that each of those aliquots of the control material is identical to all the others, as close as we're able to make it. So we should treat each of those aliquots in the same way. So we thaw and pool, we make a single pool of all the material. We aliquot in a series of vials, and all of that aliquotting is done in small volumes. Half a mil is acceptable, one mil is acceptable. In small volumes, and once all the aliquotting is completed, then those samples are transferred all together into the freezer for storage, so that they're aliquotted together, frozen together. This way there is a better chance that they are identical to each other in the conditions that they've been exposed to. So we'll be using a normal control. And this is uh, prepared in this way. It's been thawed in the water bath. And when we thaw in the water bath, this should be for somewhere between three to five minutes. When we've completed that thawing, mix by inversion, 
just in case there has been any precipitation of, uh, for instance, von Willebrand factor during the processing and storage. Shouldn't happen, but this allows for that possibility and resuspends any, any precipitate that may have occurred. So we have a normal control. The reagents are now, will be up to temperature, so we're able to proceed. The testing itself, for manual testing, should be in glass test tubes. These are borosilicate, and the, the, the nature of the glass tube is not so important, but I think it, it, can have some, it can have some impact on the results that we obtain. For APTT, for manual testing, I think it's important to test in duplicate. The precision of manual testing is not as good as the precision of APTT testing on automated systems. It's more variable. So we expect to see a higher CV for manual testing. It's for, for an internal QC material, it's going to usually be in the order of 5 to 10%. So it's an acceptable level for uh, patient management purposes, but is not at the level of 2 to 3% that might occur on an automated analyzer. Therefore, we need to test in duplicate. OK, so we're going to test the control. The volumes of testing for Manual should be the same for automated systems, equal volume of plasma, the same volume of APTT reagent, then we have an incubation that we'll talk about, and then recalcification, again, an equal volume. On many automated systems, these are frequently 50 microliters, 50 microliters, 50 microliters, and that's acceptable. For manual testing, it, it's more convenient 100 microliters of each of the three components. This gives us a bigger volume for visual observation that you'll see in a moment. So 100 microliters of control. So this now needs to come to temperature. It needs to come up to 37. We're performing this test in the glass tube and, and glass is an efficient transfer of heat. So, so this will rather quickly, the small volume will quickly come up to temperature. So one to two minutes is, is acceptable. We need a fresh tip for each uh, pipetting exercise. These are disposable pipette tips. If this sample is left for an extended period before testing, then there is the potential for change in the clotting factors present in the tube. So we don't want to leave these in at 37, 15, 20, 30 minutes. We, we need this to be in one to two minutes, come to temperature, make the test. At the moment, nothing's happening in the test tube, simply warming up to temperature. But we're about to add the APTT reagent. So this has been warmed to 37. Point one of reagent. First tube, start the stopwatch and mix. Each addition, important to mix. APTT reagent, point one, the second of the duplicates, 15 seconds, and mix. So this contains activator, it contains phospholipid. At the moment, the activator, in this case silica, is beginning contact activation. So there are a series of reactions now occurring. This activation period has to be carefully controlled, carefully timed. Sometimes it's two minutes, sometimes it's three minutes, sometimes it's 10 minutes. It depends on the activator and reagent. This particular reagent is designed for a three minute activation. So we are carefully controlling three minutes. So during this time, Contact activation, factor 12 converted to 12A. For this to happen, we need also to involve precalicrine and high molecular weight kininogen. Those three are interacting on the surface, in this case, silica, could have been kaolin, could have been elagic acid, in this case, silica. So these three factors are involved in this first process and interact in such a way that we get 
increasing activation of factor 12, more and more 12A. The longer we leave this activation, the more 12A is generated. And in a moment, when we add calcium, we'll run through the rest of the reactions. The, the, the 12A in turn activates factor 11. This is not yet calcium dependent. So we've got 12 to 12A, 11 to 11A, occurring in this test tube just now. We'll add some calcium and we'll run through the remaining reactions leading, as you know, to fibrin generation. So longer activation, more 12A, more 11A. Shorter activation, less 12A, less 11A. Longer activation, three minutes, more generation. So we're paying careful attention to the stopwatch. Remember we've got the calcium chloride warming to 37. <clears throat> the autoanalyzer of course times this uh, automatically. Working in the water bath we have to do this visually. So we're now at three minutes. Same volume, 100 microliters, calcium to the first tube and mix. At 15 seconds, remember that we added activator, APT reagent, 15 seconds later, exactly 15 seconds, second tube and mix. So both tubes now contain calcium. The activation, the clotting process is proceeding and we're tilting the test tubes, which we'll talk about in a moment. And we're looking at visual observation to look for a clot formation. I'm just going to record the clot and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this. The two clotting times we've obtained. 44 seconds. 44.4. So the first question, are the duplicates similar? Yes. Typically, we would see a difference here in a manual test at this kind of level. Ideally less than one second, might be a second and a half, just could be up to two seconds. But we hope for that kind of precision where we've got very similar results. This is the control, normal control. So we want to know from this sample for this QC material, which is the range that we expect? What's the target range of results? Is this inside our expected values? And for that, we need to refer to the uh, target range that's already been established for this particular control. And when we did this um, in the lab, this is done by repeatedly testing on different occasions the same control material. We, op we obtained a range between 35 and 46 seconds. So that's our target range. So the first question we got, 44, is it inside that range? Yes. So we've established that the reagents and water bath is working as expected. How do we, how do we assign that target? Well, if we buy a commercial control, then the manufacturer will give an indication of the relevant target for their particular instrument and reagent combination. We know the results are influenced by the reagent, but in addition by the method of endpoint detection. So the manufacturer will give a target range. If we've made a control locally, as we did in this case, then of course we have to ourselves assign a target range. And there's a section in the WFH laboratory manual that, that describes in some detail how we would recommend doing this. It's done by testing aliquots of the control lot number by testing aliquots on a series of different days, a series of different vials, and we accumulate 20 results over a period of at least 10 different days. And this allows us to take account of vial to vial variability, day to day variability, and we use that to construct a target range. And the target range we use is derived statistically. We use the mean value plus two standard deviations of the results as an upper limit, mean plus two standard deviations, and we use the mean 
minus two standard deviations as the lower limit. And again, this uh, approach is described in the laboratory manual, so we refer you to that for, for, the, for the fine detail. Okay, so we have our control result. We're content that it's within the target. It means the water bath temperature is adequate. It means the reagents are behaving in the expected way. So we're able to proceed with patient tests. I'm going to set the next test running, and then I'm going to talk about the tilting of the tubes. So we've got a series of uh, test samples. So number one is, is, a, is a sample from a patient. And we'll run an APTT with the same reagent on, on this sample. So once again, duplicate tests, two glass tubes, fresh pipette tip, hundred microliters of patient sample into each of the two glass tubes. That's for the two replicates. I need to record the control value, 44 from earlier. So we've got the plasma present in the tubes. Simply coming up to temperature, coming up to the 37 degrees. Okay. So we're going to add APTT reagent to the first one and mix. Start the, start the clock, and then at 15 seconds, APTT reagent to the second of the two duplicates, and mix. Activation, 12 to 12A, 11 to 11A. No further at the moment until we add the calcium. So whilst that's incubating, I mentioned the tilting of test tubes. There is a recommended method for tilting test tubes. It's defined by World Health Organization in relation, well, they define it in relation to testing of samples for control of anticoagulant therapy. And what their recommendation states is that the test tubes should be tilted three times every five seconds through an angle of 90 degrees. Three times every five seconds. It sounds rather quick, but actually it's not. These two tubes are empty, but just to illustrate. One, two, three. That's the kind of frequency. It's, it's not this quick. And, and why is it that frequency? It's that frequency in order to balance two things. We want to keep the reaction mixture at the operating temperature as much as possible, 37 degrees. These reactions are temperature sensitive. If the temperature drops too much, the reactions are prolonged. So we want to keep the temperature. But if we're using visual observation, as we must do for a manual method, we also want to observe the clock when it occurs. So we've got this balance. And that's the three times every five seconds, is that each time we're up, we're looking. And as you see the next tilting, you'll, you'll see that the fluid is moving down the side of the tube and then, and then back to the bottom. And, and we need to see, we need the reagent in its bulk position in the bottom in order to observe what, when does the clot form. The majority of clots which form will be uh, a fast process, will be a solid clot when it's a normal result, when it's a mild abnormality. It's fairly obvious with practice that the clot's formed. The longer the clotting time, the weaker the clot that occurs. So we're, we're approaching the three minutes, so we'll add the calcium to this first patient sample whilst we're talking. So on three minutes, calcium to the first tube and mix. On 15 seconds, 3 minutes 15 seconds, calcium to the second tube, and mix. Calcium added, 
11A from the contact phase, 11A plus calcium, 9 is activated, factor 10 is activated, prothrombin through to fibrin. So three times every five seconds through 90 degrees. Balancing the cooling as it's in the air with missing the clot as it forms. So I mentioned that the clot is weaker if the clotting time is longer. The greater the prolongation, the weaker is the endpoint. But of course, keep in mind, the longer the clotting time, the greater the abnormality, the less important one or two or three seconds becomes. If we're looking at a mild abnormality and we're asking the question, does this result sit within the normal range or is it prolonged? One or two seconds could be the difference. And that's why in those first uh, times, the early clotting, um, whilst we're observing, it's important not to miss a clot during that period as we're moving from normal to abnormal. But as we get grossly, more and more grossly prolonged, it's less important to be absolutely precise in the clotting time. Which brings us, I think, to the reference range. Now, we need to record the clotting times. Remember, this is the first patient sample. So the first clotting time is 47 seconds. The second clotting time is 48 seconds. So we'll take an average. Okay, so just zero those. Fresh tip. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start an APTT on the second patient and then we'll make some comments on reference range. So second patient. Because of course we absolutely need the reference range in order to make an interpretation of the result that we've obtained. Two glass tubes, uh, second patient. First replicate, second replicate, 100 microliters. Just warming up to temperature. We need to differentiate between control and reference range and the functions that they're performing. The control is to tell us, are we getting the same answer? today, tomorrow, yesterday, next week, are we consistent? It's not really to tell us not normal or abnormal, it's simply telling us we're under control, that the method is precise. So if we make a, let's say a normal control, it, it's frequently somewhere within the normal range. It depends how it's made. Um, it's, it's possible particularly for freeze-dried materials where there is uh, more manipulation, if it's a very large volume, for example, there can be changes in the levels of clotting factors during that processing, so that once the control is prepared, the level, the result may not always be, it's, it's very rarely within the middle of the reference range. It's often in the upper part of the reference range, and I think that's an important area. This, uh, this particular control that we're using, we, we've prepared in such a way that it sits um, a little bit above the upper limit of the normal range for this reagent. So normal control, not quite. Actually, it's a mildly prolonged abnormal control. We have also a grossly prolonged abnormal control. So I think it's an important area. So we, we do need to think about this a little bit. And so we're not using the control to give us any, you know, the relationship between the patient result and the control result, that that's not gonna tell us whether the patient is normal or abnormal. It gives some clue, but no more. For this, we absolutely need a careful reference range, which we'll talk about now. But first, let's uh, start the activation on patient number two. APTT reagent to the first tube and mix. Activation, contact activation. Essentially, no calcium present. Remember the sample we'll talk about in a moment. Citrate of plasma, very little calcium. The citrate removes the calcium, as you know. APTT reagent to the second tube. So, so whilst that's incubating, reference range. Reference range for APTT is really important. We need that to make safe conclusions about patient result. 
it should be assessed locally, in my opinion, for APTT in particular, maybe above all other tests in haemostasis, it's really important to use a reference range which is established locally. Locally, using the same blood collection tubes, the same sample storage, the same centrifugation. So for example, if patient samples are collected elsewhere in the hospital, it's usually the case, if those patient samples take between one and three hours to arrive in the lab, then centrifuge, then tested. If that's the case, we should do the same with normal subjects when we are constructing a reference range. Just because it might be possible to collect samples from normal subjects and test straight away, that's bad practice if the patient samples are, are, a, are a little bit older when they're tested. In terms of the patient samples, we absolutely have to pay attention to the stability of the sample. And we know that tests like APTT will change over time as the sample ages. We will begin to lose factor eight at some point. And that might be a tube specific change. For most of the currently used blood collection tubes, we're, it's acceptable to perform APTTs on a sample within the first four hours from collection to testing. So it's unlikely to be an, a clinically relevant change in four hours. At least if we're talking about um, bleeding disorders as, as we are just now, perhaps one exception, one important exception, if we were working with unfractionated heparin samples, their clinically relevant changes begin in the two to four hour period. So there we absolutely have to uh, set a different criteria. For bleeding disorder work, haemophilia and so on, we won't see any important changes in four hours for the currently used blood collection tubes. So we've got, we've got that four hour window. But again, we want to treat samples from normal subjects in the same way as patient samples when we're constructing a reference range. We need to do the clots and I'll come back to that point. So exactly on three minutes. When APTTs are run on automated systems, there's usually some tolerance. So even though we set the protocol on the system to add the calcium at three minutes in this case, even though we do that, on most analyzers there's some tolerance. It might be plus or minus five seconds, that, that kind of thing. And in fact, this has very little impact. So although I'm carefully timing this, two, three, four, five seconds has a pretty minor impact on the results that we'll obtain. Okay, so we've added the calcium. Tilting the tubes, three times, five seconds, 90 degrees. If you go above 90 degrees, it tips out. Okay, but I, I can see the watch, you can't. So I, I'm already up to 50, 55 seconds. So much longer than the control, prolonging. So we're already expecting to see an abnormal result. And I mentioned, I think, that the endpoint is weaker when the clotting time is longer. This is a much longer clotting time, as you can see. And the, the clot that forms, it, it, it's still a clear change. It's a slightly slower process. So in the weaker clot at this longer time, there are, there are, the clotting process is more drawn out over three, four seconds sometimes. And sometimes people will say, so what, what do I call it? Which is my end point? Is it the beginning of that process? Is it, is it the end? It, it's not so important, of course, because the clotting time we've obtained here on the first duplicate is 90, 100, it's 116 seconds. 116 seconds. And on the second one is 113 seconds. So I'm going to write that down whilst I remember. So 116, 113, so three seconds difference. The difference between replicates typically increases as the time is longer, but of course that's less impact on the decision we'll make. It's a grossly gross, it's a grossly prolonged APTT that we're, that we're dealing with. 
So I come back to the endpoint. So it's spread out over three or four seconds at this, at this level. And I think the important thing is to be consistent, but again, it, it, it's not so important if we call it the beginning or the end of that process. I, I think in practice, commonly we, in my centre, we, we use the first changes that are clearly a clot forming. But, but again, I, I think it's not such a big issue. The level of fibrinogen in the sample has an important impact on the features of the clot. Very important. The lower the fibrinogen, the weaker the clot is. And even if the APTT that we're now talking about is only marginally prolonged, two, three, four seconds, even at that degree of abnormality, if there is a particularly low level of fibrinogen, the clot is very weak, it's very wispy. It transitions very quickly from the, from the, the first visible solid clot formation. This very quickly contracts into a fine mesh, looks like a, a fishing net and, and becomes very small. And, and that process moves really quite quickly if there is a very low fibrinogen concentration. So sometimes you will find yourself looking and thinking, was it a clot, was it no? In, in this case, think about the fibrinogen concentration, particularly if that occurs um, at, a, at a mild level of abnormality. Okay, so we've recorded the time on number two. So we're gonna come back to reference range, but let's start number three whilst we're talking. Fresh pipette tip. Test plasma number three. Guess what? Equal volume, 100 microliters, just warming up to temperature. So back to reference range. So it's really important for APTT to assess this locally. It's important to use healthy normal donors. I think it's not acceptable to use samples from patients who have normal clotting results. If you do that, it introduces bias because the patients in the hospital, in the majority at least, are in the hospital f for a reason and, it, and they don't meet the criteria of a healthy normal subject usually, otherwise they're not in the hospital. And if you try to make an APTT reference range from patient samples, even selecting those with apparently normal clotting, then there is a bias and you will usually end up with a falsely low APTT reference range. And, and that happens because these patients have higher factor eights, higher fibrinogens than healthy normal subjects. So I think it's important to use healthy normal subjects. I'm going to start the activation whilst we're talking. APTT reagent. First sample. First replica. APTT reagent, second replica. Start of the clock, three minutes. So it's important to use healthy normal subjects. So where do we, where do we access those? Well, what frequently happens, what happens in my centre, is that we use volunteers from hospital staff. And if we do that, laboratory staff usually, if we do that, then we need to have an ethics process in place to deal with it. Those normal subjects should give written informed consent to give a blood sample in the knowledge with an explanation that this will be used to perform tests of hemostasis in order to construct reference ranges. The second important thing to keep in mind is that it's possible to inadvertently identify an outline result that could be a relevant abnormality. It occurs. Uh, it occurs from time to time um, in relation to clotting, we know that, for instance, in many populations, the incidence of factor V Leiden is about 5% of the healthy normal population. So if we're testing 20, 30 subjects, it's not a surprise that we'll find one or two of these in, in that group, and that's what happens. There may be other uh, unexpected defects, which are abnormalities which are detected as part of this process. So we need a mechanism to deal with that. In my centre, we have uh, an informed consent process, the individual signs to say I'm, I'm happy for these tests to be done and indicates whether or not they wish to be informed if an outline result is, ob is obtained. And why do, we, why, they, why do they have the choice? They have the choice because there could be implications for medical, legal reasons, insurance, whatever. The vast majority of people say, please tell me. Um, and when that happens, they're offered an interview with 
the consultant haematologist if they have an outline result that could be relevant. And the consultant haematologist will go through any relevant clinical picture that, that may have implications now or in the future. So I think it's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that these, these things can happen. The number of normal subjects that's needed. Well, we've got publications and guidelines, particularly from colleagues in clinical chemistry, that make a sound statistical for defence for why it's necessary for full statistical validity, it's necessary to test 120 or, or more normal subjects. But we've also got our useful guidelines in the WFH lab manual, also from CLSI, that remind us actually we can obtain a, a close approximate from even, even 20 to 25 healthy normal subjects when it comes to tests like PT and APTT, we can obtain a close approximation, sufficiently close for clinical purposes. So I think we do not need to test 120 for APTT, for example. Three minutes. Calcium to the first. Three minutes, 15. Calcium to the second. In my centre, we test 20 to 25 each time we change a lot number of APTT reagents. And I'm convinced that's sufficient for clinical management purposes. Especially because we should think about how do we use the information? It's calculated using statistical data reduction. Since the results are normally distributed usually, then we use a mean plus two standard deviations as the upper limit and a mean minus two standard deviations as the lower limit. That includes, as you know, 95% of the population, but excludes 5%. So one in 20, we expect to see outside that reference range without a clinically relevant abnormality. So inside or outside the reference range, it, it, it's not the whole picture. It's absolutely not the whole picture. It's a guide. It needs to be used used in conjunction with the patient's history. An absolutely key, key part to make decisions about if a result, should a, if a result lies outside the reference range, how important is that? That's got to be put alongside the patient's status, history, and, and so on. And, and that clinical interpretation is absolutely key. So, so the normal range is a, is a guide. It's important to have it properly assessed. For APTT, should be done locally. We'll just record this value on number three. 75.6. 76.5. So the reference range for this method we're now using. We've, we've established it locally in the way that I've described. Same tubes, <clears throat> same blood collection tubes as those used for patients. 20 to 25 normal subjects, same centrifugation, same processing. Because our APTTs are performed on samples which have not been frozen, but in that interval, two to four hours after collection usually, that's the same for the normal subjects. Not on frozen samples. Processed, let's say fresh, not frozen. In, in that same time interval. So it's treated in the same way. And when we did that for this particular reagent, the upper limit of the normal range was uh, 38, 39 seconds for this particular, close to 39 seconds for this particular lot number. So on the patients we've done so far, sample one, 47 and a half, mild prolongation. Second sample, 113, 116, pretty gross prolongation. Third sample, 75, 76, so, so also an important prolongation. So we've got also a couple more test samples. Um, okay. So we'll start the next one running. So we've got some prolonged results. What do we do? There are broadly two possibilities, as you know. We could be dealing with deficiency, a missing clotting factor, 
or alternatively, the clotting factors are all present and something is interfering with the reaction, something is slowing down the reactions, for example, an inhibitor. So we have a number of tests available to us to uh, further investigate these defects, specific factor assays, specific inhibitor assays, and so on. But of course, these are quite time-consuming tests, and uh, these are expensive tests. So I, I think it's very useful to get some further information from APTT to make decisions that will shape our later investigations. These should, of course, be influenced by the patient's clinical picture. This is absolutely key, the bleeding history, absolutely key. But we can make some additional, fairly straightforward, uh, relatively cheap tests at this point that will, I think, give us some important clues about the possible nature of the defects that might allow us to focus in on, on a particular area for further testing. So we know that we may be dealing here with uh, deficiency, missing factor. We may be dealing with interference, inhibitors. And so I think a, a very useful way to help differentiate between these two and, and again to shape what we do next is to make a mixture. A mixture of patient sample with pooled normal plasma. Pooled normal plasma, by definition, will contain all the clotting factors. It must be carefully prepared in such a way that we're very confident it cannot, does not contain anything that might have inhibitors. So we have to think carefully about the source material for this. Pooled normal plasma will contain normal concentrations of all the clotting factors, the contact factors, also factor eight, factor nine, 10, all the clotting factors. So if we make a mixture, an equal volume of patient sample with pooled normal plasma, each contributing half to that mixture. If the patient is missing, is deficient in one of the clotting factors, it will be provided in the pooled normal plasma. Pooled normal plasma has approximately somewhere around 100 international units per deciliter. Some people would say 100%, would strongly prefer international units per deciliter. Normal plasma contains close to, usually, 100 international units per deciliter. Factor eight, factor nine, all the clotting factors. If the patient sample is deficient in factor eight, like let's say it were fully deficient, it completely lacks severe haemophilia A, zero, less than one international units per deciliter. In that equal mix, simple maths, the level is approximately 50 international units per deciliter. We've added the missing clotting factor. And in this case, with a normal or close to normal concentration, we anticipate a normal or close to normal APTT. So we can make use of that information. Where we've got an abnormality, a prolonged APTT, if we add normal plasma and the defect is corrected, the clotting time is corrected, back or very close to the normal range, most likely we've added the missing clotting factor. And this makes us think in particular, of course, about clotting factor deficiency. At this point, we don't know, is it eight, is it nine, is it something else? And we need to go on and do further tests to characterize that. If we make the mixture of normal plasma patient sample, and we make an APTT on this, and it remains grossly prolonged, that would mean adding the normal clotting factors hasn't improved the APTT. It's not been corrected, it's remained grossly prolonged. In this case, we can be very confident that something is interfering, inhibiting the reactions. We don't know yet the nature of this inhibitor, but it's a strong suggestion that an inhibitor is present. Often an antibody, not always. Other types of inhibitor, direct, anti -anti direct acting anticoagulants. Heparin, present in the test sample, still present in the mixture, 
will prolong APTT in that mixture. So we can start to draw some clues about what the nature of the defect might be. This was patient number four whilst we're talking. It's a very weak endpoint in this. I apologise that you can't see it, but it, it, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny clot. And that's typical of a, a, a grossly prolonged time. In this case, 147 or 145. So a, a pretty gross prolongation. 147, 145. Okay, so we know a 50-50 mix without any correction, leaving a grossly prolonged APTT on that mixture, an inhibitor is present. I mentioned that if, there is, if the time is restored normal or close to normal, most likely it is a factor deficiency. But we have to keep in mind also that there are different types of inhibitor. Some inhibitors are able to exert their effect immediately, immediate acting inhibitors. The most common of these would be non-specific, not specifically directed against an individual clotting factor, but an antibody which blocks the reactions where they occur on the phospholipid present in the reagent. Lupus anticoagulant is the uh, most uh, common of these, and the most, in most uh, populations, the most frequent inhibitors of coagulation are, are lupus-type anticoagulants, traditionally described as inhibitors antibodies against phospholipid. In, in truth, now that the, mechanism, the mechanisms are better understood, these are antibodies against proteins bound to phospholipid. The impact is the same. The, the, the location and the, the area on the phospholipid is blocked. It's not available. It's not available to participate in the reactions supporting the activation of factor 10, the activation of prothrombin, the reactions which occur during clot formation. So the antibody slows, dramatically slows down this process. And a common feature of lupus anticoagulants, this type of inhibition is, occurs straight away. As soon as the mixture is made, the antibody is able to exert its effect and the long APTT typically remains prolonged. There's a dilution effect. Remember we've mixed one volume patient plus one volume of pooled normal plasma. So there is a dilution factor for the patient sample where the antibody is contained, dilution factor one in two. So this can reduce a little bit and have some impact on the APTT, so we may see some movement from its extreme prolongation. It may move in the direction of the normal range, but remains usually substantially prolonged. So, so we have to look in, in some detail at the results. Now, back to the four uh, test plasmas we've, we've used. We've got some prolonged results. So in order to help us make decisions about which tests to perform next, in terms of expensive, time-consuming specific assays, I think it's useful to make some mixtures and to repeat APTTs. So we'll, we'll do that on, on, on these now. So we need to make a, a mixture. So I'm going to use plastic tubes for this. Remember, we'll be using two shots of 100 microliters. We'll need 200 microliters of the mix to make an APTT. So I'm going to make a mixture, 300 microliters of patient, 300 microliters of pooled normal plasma, and this will give us more than enough. We should make the mixture on patient number one, make the test. Make the mixture on patient number two, make the test. Make the mixture, and so on. So we shouldn't make all these mixtures up because the, there is a potential for change in that mixture once it's constructed. We'll, we'll come back to that point because I think it's important. Okay, so we have a, a pooled normal plasma. One volume, 
in this case 300 microliters, same volume of patient sample, this is patient number one, and mix. So we've diluted one-to-one -one patient with pooled normal plasma. So if the patient sample is missing one of the clotting factors, we will now provide it from the normal plasma that's been added. So now the APTT is the same. Now let's get this moving along and we'll just keep talking. So this is an immediate mix. We'll, we'll come back to that point in a moment. Just warming up. Now if you remember, patient number one had an APTT of around 48 seconds. Upper limit of normal, 38, 39 for this method. So it's, it's prolonged. It's not uh, dramatically prolonged in the same way that some of the others are. And we can draw some conclusions from that. This, is, this will not be a patient who completely lacks one of the clotting factors. If a patient completely lacked factor eight, severe haemophilia A, APTT will be much, much longer than this for this reagent, typically 90, 100, 110 seconds, maybe longer. This is only 47, 48. So that already tells us we're probably not looking at, almost certainly not looking at, a really, really severe deficiency. Probably this will be something, if it's deficiency, it will be something with a, a milder abnormality. So it will contain some concentration. Let's start the APTT on this. And of course the mixture, equal volume patient pooled normal, so the level in this mixture is intermediate, halfway between whatever is the patient level, whatever is the pooled normal. APTT to the first one, a mix, and to the second one. So if it doesn't move, same degree of prolongation, we're thinking about inhibitors. If it moves back towards the normal range, we're thinking much more likely a deficiency. Well, not all inhibitors act immediately. We mentioned the most frequently occurring in most populations, the most frequently occurring inhibitor antibody, lupus anticoagulant, characterized by immediate inhibition, immediately acting. Inhibitors against clotting factors, individual clotting factors, specific antibodies, specific inhibitors, are much rarer than lupus anticoagulant and behave in different ways. So typically, uh, acquired, typically, antibodies against factor eight either occur in, in severe haemophiliacs who have received replacement therapy, replacement with factor eight, triggers an immune response, as you know. Either of those patients, congenital haemophilia, antibodies secondary to treatment, or patients who've acquired autoantibodies and developed haemophilia in later life, acquired haemophilia. In, in both cases, often the anti-factor A antibody is, is not immediate acting. Often it's a time-dependent inhibitor in other words, there is progressive loss of factor VIII through binding to antibody, and the progression is time dependent. The longer we leave that mixture, the more the antibody is able to bind and destroy factor VIII. Longer incubation, more loss. Antibodies against factor IX, significantly less common in the UK, about, we have about 1,000 haemophilia B patients and, and less than 20 patients with antibodies against factor IX. So, 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 so quite rare. But most anti-factor IX antibodies are, are able to exert their impact really, really very quickly. So it, it's, not, it's not time dependent in the way that acquired and way that anti-factor VIII antibodies are. They don't need one, two hours to really exert the, the, the peak of inhibitory effect. So, so there are differences. It means that we've got, again, some immediate acting inhibitors. We may have time-dependent inhibitors. 
three minutes. And we need to be able to characterize and detect the differences between these types of antibody. If an antibody is uh, particularly time dependent, particularly acquired antibodies against factor VIII, time dependent, needs time to exert its effect. In this case, when we make the mixture of pooled normal and patient sample, it may be that in, in immediately after that mixture is constructed, the APTT is normal or close to normal. That can occur. If we then incubate that mixture over a period of time, incubate it at 37 degrees, there's progressive interaction, progressive loss. And we see the APTT, which initially corrects, which initially comes back close to the normal range, over that one, two hour period, lengthening, moving longer and longer. So there, there is some merit, at least, in performing that kind of incubated mix to look at whether or not the APTT in that mixture changes substantially over time. In my experience, it can be very difficult to interpret the results of such an incubated mix, and so we have to be very, sometimes have to be careful with how it's done and interpreted. But we'll come back to that. Okay, so patient number one, equal volume mixture, pooled normal plasma, patient sample. 35 and a half seconds, 37 seconds. 35 and a half, 37. Upper limit of normal, 39. Inside, so the patient alone, 47, 48 seconds. Equal mix with normal plasma. Is it shorter? Yes. Has it corrected back close to or inside the reference range? Yes. In this case, it's just inside the reference range. So that's an indication. It confirms we do not have an immediate acting inhibitor. We don't have a lupus anticoagulant. We don't have an immediate acting inhibitor. It's more likely that we're dealing with deficiency because we've got a full correction back into the reference range. And that might shape our next investigations. I think in this case, we'll look, we'd look at the patient's history, of course, and be influenced by this, but we might then move into specific factor assays on, on this patient. We'll, we'll talk some more about this question of in, incubated mixtures. Patient number two. Same pooled normal plasma. Plastic tube. Three hundred microliters in this case. Fresh tip. Patient number two. A mix. Two glass tubes. Immediate mix. No incubation at this point. 100 microliters each tube. Just warming up to temperature. If a patient has a lupus anticoagulant, immediate acting inhibitor. Whatever impact we see, whatever APTT we see, once that mixture is just prepared, immediately tested, if we then incubate that mixture, one hour, two hours, in the water bath, we don't see much change. It, it does not progressively increase. Whatever effect we're likely to see is there at the beginning, doesn't change much over time, very little. In contrast to time-dependent inhibitors, start the APTT reagent. In contrast to incubated mixtures, time-dependent inhibitors. If we had a time-dependent inhibitor, for example, an acquired anti-factor VIII antibody, if, if this were present, we make the mixture, make the APTT immediately. Often, there is an intermediate effect 
there is some shortening. The APTT moves in the direction of the normal range. It may even move right back into the normal range in such a patient. It, it, it does occur in some. If we incubate that mixture then for two hours at 37, there is a progressive, substantial increase in APTT over time. And some centres use this uh, in order to make decisions about whether to move on and do a specific factor eight inhibitor assay. The factor eight inhibitor assay, also described in the uh, WFH laboratory manual, you'll be aware, I imagine, involves a two hour incubation. In my own center, we prefer to make, if there is a possibility of an inhibitor present, we prefer to make that specific factor eight inhibitor assay using those same two hours, rather than using that two hours to make some APTT mixtures, draw some possible conclusions that may well lead us to go on and do the factor eight inhibitor assay anyway. I, I prefer to use that two hours on the specific test. The information is much uh, safer in terms of interpretation. The problem with incubated mixtures, in my opinion, it can be difficult to interpret. If we have a very strong, uh, powerful inhibitor present with a high theta, 2, 5, 10, 20, well, particularly 5, 10, 20 Bethesda units per mil, if we have a high theta antibody, the results are fairly clear cut. It, it's fairly obvious that an inhibitor is present. The problem is when there is a low teeter antibody, one, two, maybe three Bethesda units. But this is an important area because this may have an important impact on decision making in terms of treatment options. Some guidelines have a, a threshold for decision, different decision making at five Bethesda units per mil, but, but there can be uh, also decisions a little bit different according to antibody teeter at lower levels. So I think it's really important that we don't miss low teeter antibodies and, and that in my opinion is the risk. If we do an incubated mix we may obtain a false negative in which we fail to detect a low teeter antibody and I think that's a big issue. So my preference is to go for the more specific test and not to make the incubated mixtures for that reason. I accept that some centres have uh, done this successfully. Okay, three minutes and calcium to the first. Calcium to the second. Patient number two. If you remember, APTT, 116, 113. Pretty grossly prolonged APTT. For most reagents, and certainly for this one, that would be a result indicative, if it were a deficiency, of really quite a low level. Probably a missing clotting factor. So you can see the clots have gone. 36 seconds, 36 and a half. So that's a pretty substantial correction. Once again, same as the previous sample, it's corrected inside the reference range from a really, really gross prolongation. That's very likely to be a deficiency. Keeping in mind, to get these occasional samples, quiet haemophilia, pretty impressive correction initially, but prolonging over time. So again, the clinical picture is really, really important. If this were potentially a sample, that were potentially a sample from acquired haemophilia, there would be some big clues in the patient's clinical picture that clinical colleagues would absolutely recognize. Third sample, we need to equal mix, normal plasma, 300 microliters, Patient sample number three, equal mix. 
100 microliters. Just warming up to temperature. Patient number three, APTT earlier, 75.6, 76, 76 seconds. So, so quite a marked prolongation, or limit of normal, 39. If that's a deficiency, it's going to be quite a low level. It would be a two, three, four units per, international units per deciliter. Could, of course, be an inhibitor. Warming up to temperature. APTT reagent. Two really important components in the APTT reagent. We've talked about one already, activator, silica, kaolin, elagic acid. The other really, really important component is the phospholipids present in that reagent. What are they doing? They're, they're, they're taking the place of phospholipids in activated platelets or activated cell membranes in the patient. You know that when clotting occurs in the patient, the reactions are occurring on, on the surface of activated cells like platelets. Here we've got phospholipid present in the reagent to try and mimic that process, to, to substitute for the, for the platelets in that process. Phospholipids in APTT reagents are made in a, a number of different ways. Sometimes they're extracted from tissues, that still occurs. Very frequently they're highly purified, and for many reagents these days they're not just highly purified but are synthetically manufactured and, and carefully controlled so that the reagents, the phospholipids present in the reagent, are, are, are very specific. But well, they're quite different between different reagents. And one of the reasons for this is historical and, and is about the lack of standardization in the past. But I think another reason is because very frequently laboratories are using APTT in several very different settings. Even those of us particularly focused on bleeding disorders and wanting to detect mild hemophilia A, mild hemophilia B and so on, even, the, even those laboratories are usually also doing tests in patients with, with other problems and, and are very frequently also uh, monitoring unfractionated heparin therapy. Um, and, and, and I may also very often be looking for the presence of lupus anticoagulant. And so we're really asking several different questions of this reagent. And in many centres, and there are practical advantages, in, in many centres, a single APTT reagent is used for these very different functions. And so often it's a compromise when a manufacturer constructs a reagent, it's a compromise between what would be ideal for detection of mild haemophilia, what would be ideal for detection of lupus anticoagulant for monitoring unfractionated heparin. And it's not the same. So we're very frequently working with a compromised situation. And for whatever reason, the composition and concentration of phospholipids in these reagents are very, very different, extremely different. And this has an important impact on the results, depending on the defect. So the first duplicate's clotted. And the second. So we've got 59 seconds and 62 seconds. 59, 62. Patient number three. The APTT on the patient sample, 76. On this equal volume mixture, 59, 62. Around 60 seconds. So it's a little bit shorter, 10 seconds shorter, but it's still substantially prolonged. Substantially. Upper limit of normal. 39. Grossly prolonged. So, for sure, we have an inhibitor present in this sample. Still grossly prolonged. Is it immediately immediate acting? Well, it is, yes, because we made the mix, we did the test. Gross prolongation. Remember, we've done a, some dilution, a one in two dilution, effectively, of whatever is the antibody concentration in the patient sample is diluted one in two in that mix. 
Nevertheless, it's still grossly prolonged. So for sure we have an inhibitor, an immediate acting inhibitor. Okay, last mix. Pull normal plasma. Three hundred microliters. Patient sample. Number four. Two tubes. Immediate mix. Warming up. So the phospholipid concentration has an important effect on the results which we'll obtain. It has the biggest impact, the phospholipid concentration and profile has the biggest impact on results in the presence of lupus anticoagulant. Lupus anticoagulant patients are extremely heterogeneous. There are many, many different antibodies, very frequently unique in a patient, so really quite different between different patients. And so probably it's not a surprise that the impact of these antibodies is very different according to the phospholipids present in different APTT reagents. So what happens is the degree of prolongation may differ. Whether or not the result is normal or abnormal also differs between patients depending on the reagent. And in particular, the phospholipid concentration is a, is a major determinant of whether or not there will be a prolonged time when we make an APTT. And there are some very big differences between the concentration of phospholipids in different APTT reagents. Very big differences. About a 20-fold higher concentration in some reagents than in others, 20 times higher in some. And, and if the concentration is very much higher, this reagent will usually be very much less sensitive to, less affected by lupus anticoagulants. And, and that, that's a fairly typical finding. So we've got a dilemma in the lab when we are thinking about which APTT reagent to use whilst we're running this correction. We've got a dilemma. If we choose a reagent which is, has a very high phospholipid concentration, then we will less frequently detect lupus anticoagulant. If we use a very low phospholipid concentration, we will much more frequently detect it. So we have to ask ourselves which, 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 which is the area, which is the advantage, where are the disadvantages? And I think an important question is, if we're, if we're looking for lupus anticoagulant, if we're investigating a patient for possible lupus anticoagulant because of the clinical features in that patient, then I think we want to use lupus sensitive reagents, that, that's clear. On the other hand, if we are screening patients for possible bleeding disorders, and it's very common practice uh, in many, uh, many centres around the world, many countries, it's very common practice to perform APTT as a screen prior to surgery, if, if it's major surgery. Actually the evidence, the published evidence and the guidelines available to us recommend against that, recommend against indiscriminate use of AB, APTT, recommend a targeted approach based on bleeding history. If the patient has a positive history, absolutely make the tests. But in the absence of a positive history, the evidence suggests a pre-op abnormality in APTT is not a good predictor of post-op bleeding or problems or presence of a bleeding disorder. So the recommendations are not to perform APTTs in mass pre-op screening. Nevertheless, it's very common practice in many centres because sometimes for historical reasons. And in this case, what happens if we, by chance, when, by chance, we detect lupus anticoagulant? The clotting screen is done, including APTT. Patient is due to have surgery. We obtain an abnormality in APTT. It needs to be explained then because it could be an undetected, undiagnosed mild von Willebrand's disease, mild bleeding disorder. 
We have to find the reason. And yet, very frequently, what we detect in such a patient is the presence of a lupus anticoagulant, prolonging APTT. Somebody goes to the patient and says, well, you know there may be a problem. We've got to explain this abnormal APTT before we can be safe to proceed with surgery. And then a period that maybe the operation is cancelled. The patient is subject to anxiety, as you can imagine. There is additional clinical time in further investigations. There's additional laboratory time, laboratory expense. We do a number of tests, and at the end of that time, we identify presence very frequently, presence of lupus anticoagulant. What happens to the patient? Well, first, the surgery is allowed because it's very unusual for any bleeding to be associated. Very occasionally there's acquired prothrombin deficiency, but the vast, vast majority of patients with lupus anticoagulant, perfectly safe to have the surgery. So the surgery proceeds, and so one, two, three days later, somebody says to the patient, when we said there may be a problem, actually it's just this chance finding, prolonged APTT, lupus anticoagulant, surgery is safe. So that, that patient uh, will still be anxious, that's human nature. And what happens after the surgery? In many centres, there is no intervention in the management in such a patient. It, there's, there's no absolute con consensus internationally, to the best of my knowledge, about whether such patients should or should not be managed. They're described as moderate risk, moderate risk of thrombosis or clinical complications, moderate risk in the present ISTH uh, lupus anticoagulant guideline. But in many centres, there is no active management of such a patient. And if there is no active management, then probably it's a bad thing to have detected that antibody. And in such a setting, in my opinion, it's much better to have used a lupus insensitive reagent during those initial testing in order to avoid that problem. Patient anxiety, laboratory work, clinical time, no intervention at the end. I think it's bad medicine. So we personally, in my own centre, we use a lupus insensitive reagent as the routine APTT screening test for that reason. Again, if we're looking for lupus anticoagulant, no, of course, we need a sensitive reagent. Patient number four, 50-50 mixed, 46 seconds, 46 seconds. Now, if you remember patient number four, 146, 146 APTT, grossly, grossly prolonged, 50-50 mix. It's much, much shorter, 46 seconds, but it's not back into the reference range. Upper limit of reference range, 39. So if it were an isolated single factor deficiency, we would have expected that mixture to come right back down 39, 38, 37, as we saw in some of those previous mixtures. So it's intermediate. Certainly it's shorter, it's substantially shorter. But it's possible to have here, possibly, a time-dependent in inhibitor. It doesn't look like a lupus anticoagulant because it's clearly much shorter than the patient. But neither has it corrected all the way back, so it's possible to have a time-dependent inhibitor in this sample. So the tests we've performed so far are with one particular APTT reagent. I just want to do a couple of tests, just APTTs, on two of those samples. And I want to repeat that now with the second APTT reagent. So I'm going to put out um, some of this to be warming. This one actually contains a, a fluid phase activator, elagic acid. So I'm going to replace this to be warming up with the first one. Different APTT reagent. Make sure we've got enough, no, a little bit more calcium chloride. So I want to retest APTT on the, 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 some of the patient samples. Let's see what we get. We are compelled to do a control first. It's a different reagent. 
we need to be sure that this is working appropriately. So we need normal control first. This is a different reagent. It contains a significantly higher phospholipid concentration. It's not the only difference between these two reagents. The activator is elagic acid, the previous one silica. The biggest difference is in the phospholipid concentration. This second reagent, the concentration is around 15, 15 to 20 times higher than the concentration in the first reagent. So if we were dealing with a factor deficiency, the numbers may be slightly different, often are slightly different, but we will see, again, gross abnormality. Much higher phospholipid concentration. If we're dealing with lupus anticoagulant, that may have an important difference. It's likely the prolongation would be substantially less. If we're dealing with an antibody against factor VIII, we're going to see gross, gross prolongation with, with any reagent. So we can start to, by looking at the pattern with these two numbers, two reagents, we, we, we may be able to draw some conclusions about the test plasmas. Okay. FTT reagent, this is the control. This one also has a three minute activation time. Okay. The main cause of differences between APTTs performed with different reagents. The most frequent cause of a big, big difference, lupus anticoagulant, for the reasons I've mentioned, it's all about the phospholipid concentration. But there is a second, much rarer, rather rare, uh, defect in which we may see, do see, quite different APTTs according to the reagent. And, and that's patients who have precalicrine deficiency. It's a rare event. In my center, we've seen two or three over the last 10 years testing 200 patients a day for APTT. So it's a rare event. But it's in the literature and we noticed also the same. If you make the APTT with most APTT reagents, there is a very gross prolongation of clotting time, 90, 100 seconds maybe. With the exception of reagents in which the activator utilizes elagic acid. Remember one of these does. If the activator is elagic acid, we noticed, and again it's in the literature, that the contact phase runs at a normal rate and the APTT is normal. So we see a gross prolongation with most reagents, but a normal result if the activator is elagic acid. It's a rare event, but it's, also, it's, it's the only time we see that pattern, not as a consequence of lupus anticoagulant. Just something to keep, keep in mind. Well, the other important point about such patients, precalicrine deficiency, no bleeding tendency. Absolutely no bleeding whatsoever in relation to that behaving in a normal way. So the, the, the most prolonged APTTs we saw, if you remember, were in number two, number three, number four, a little bit shorter in patient number one. Control is incubating and we're up to three minutes. Just whilst we're incubating these last few APTTs, the other, area, the, the other area that's absolutely important to keep in mind for APTT are pre-analytical variables. 
it's the way the sample is collected and handled has a, has a really important impact on APTT. It's the test um, amongst clotting tests which is most affected by problems in sample collection and processing. Control time 38, 39. So that's a little shorter than the other reagent. Any problems in collecting the sample, difficult to venipuncture, any delays in blood collected into a syringe prior to mixing with anticoagulant, that these can lead to changes in the sample which impact on APTT more than any of the other tests. We can start to get clotting activation in the sample, generates enzymes, and it can mean when we make the APTT, sometimes we're seeing um, extremely short times because we've got enzymes present, uh, sometimes we're seeing consumption of clotting factors and by the time we're making the test the sample's partially clotted, we've, we've lost some of the clotting factors and we can see artificial prolongation. In particular, uh, any kind of hemolysis of the sample that's artificial, anything that's occurred during collection and processing, even, even very minor levels of hemolysis can impact on APTT, causing changes in both directions, sometimes false prolongation, in, in particular and more frequently, falsely shortened APTTs. And of course that allows really a, 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 the worst scenario, which is a, a falsely normal result. If we're using APTT to screen for a possible bleeding disorder and we get a falsely normal result, that could prevent, depends on local protocols, but that could prevent additional investigations that would have been needed. So I think we really don't want to see false normal results. And that can occur in relation, in the presence of femalized samples. So in my opinion, it's absolutely essential to have robust checks in place to detect hemolysis and to reject such samples and not to test them for APTT. Unless we believe the hemolysis has occurred actually in vivo in the patient. It's from time to time, of course, this will occur, transfusion reaction, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, sickle cell crisis, that there are some occasions. But the vast majority of uh, samples arriving in the lab, blue top citrate samples, arriving in the lab with visible hemolysis, vast majority, it's an artifact, it's occurred in the sample, and that sample should not be tested. We will uh, absolutely see uh, an impact on the results, an important impact. The APTT is also particularly sensitive to the ratio of blood to anticoagulant in the tube, the filling of the tube. You know that the normal ratio, one part anticoagulant, nine parts blood. If we deviate from that, and re particularly if we reduce the volume of blood, therefore the volume of plasma, change the ratio of citrate to plasma, there are important dilution effects, citrate excess, false prolongation. A similar situation can occur if a patient has an elevated hematocrit, 55 or 0.55 if you prefer, and higher, can start to have an impact on results of APTT. And there is a section in the WFH laboratory manual, a small table that shows how to make an adjustment in this citrate to blood ratio in order to deal with this problem of uh, citrate excess in the presence of raised hematocrits. And I think it's important to do that, particularly if the hematocrit is up around 0.6 or 60 or, or higher. We see occasionally as high as 0.7 or 70%, depends on your units. Okay, three minutes. Calcium. Patient number one. 
Okay, so 39, 40 seconds. This is a different APT reagent, as I mentioned. Has a different reference range. Previous reagent, upper limit of reference range 39. This has an upper limit of reference range of 29. So 39, 40 seconds, prolonged result. First reagent, 47, 48. Up of normal 39, prolonged result. So we've got a pretty similar degree of prolongation in both, both reagents. This is a patient with mild, we're not doing any more tests, so I'll tell you the answer. This is a patient with mild haemophilia. The level of factor VIII, 30 international units per deciliter. For these two reagents, we're seeing a prolongation. And of course, that's what we want. We want to see a prolongation. We want to detect that abnormality. It's a clinically relevant abnormality. Just whilst we're talking about that, I'm going to start number two with the second reagent. We only have a few more tests. Bear with us. So these two reagents, clearly prolonged result, 30 international units per deciliter. Actually, it was 29 in this patient, I remember. These are sensitive reagents in relation to factor VIII deficiency, mild haemophilia. We have guidelines available to us, but there is some, there's a lack of consensus really on, on which is the level of deficiency that we would like to detect. I think everybody has agreed that we want to see an abnormality in an APTT where factor VIII is 30 or less. That's a common feature. But of course, some patients with mild haemophilia, mild von Willebrand's disease, just start the activation. Uh, some patients, 35, 40 units per deciliter. Factor VIII. And so it's important also to detect these patients. Whilst they may not have day-to-day -day problems, of course, there are important times where they're going to need protection. So we, we want to know about these levels. And there is some variability between different APTT reagents in their sensitivity to the levels of factor VIII. The really poor reagents that were available many, many years ago have largely disappeared. So the majority of uh, reagents currently available to us will usually give us prolonged APTTs f for any uh, levels of factor VIII below 30. In the 30 to 50 area, in that zone, uh, let's say getting up towards the reference range, then, then there is variability between reagents. So for most reagents, we will sometimes see a normal APTT in the presence of 40, 45 units per deciliter factor VIII. We have to keep that in mind. It's one reason why we can't use a normal APTT to exclude the presence of mild haemophilia or mild von Willebrand's disease. There is another reason. Some mild haemophiliacs have a particular defect in the factor VIII gene, which impacts on the activity of factor VIII in a chromogenic assay or a two-stage clotting assay, but doesn't affect how the factor VIII works during a one-stage assay or in an APTT. So those small subgroup of mild haemophilia patients, normal APTT, normal one-stage factor VIII assay, but do have mild haemophilia, have bleeding symptoms consistent with mild haemophilia, have identifiable, a number have been identified, defects in the factor VIII gene, some of which affect the stability of the factor VIII. Sometimes that's the cause of the difference in the different tests, but, but nevertheless, these patients do have mild haemophilia, do have bleeding consistent with that, therefore we want to detect them, and they'll be missed by APTT. So we can't use a normal APTT to fully exclude mild haemophilia A. Thinking about mild haemophilia B, it's a feature of pretty well any APTT reagent that it will usually be more sensitive to levels of factor VIII than to levels of factor IX. We know this because if we use those reagents in one stage factor assays, we can draw some conclusions from the uh, dose response curve in the factor assays and they're almost always uh, a steeper slope for one stage factor VIII than for one stage factor IX as an indication of this, this issue. It means that we will more frequently see normal APTTs in the presence of mild haemophilia B. So in particular, 
haemophilia B, mild haemophilia B in the 30 to 40 to 50 units per deciliter, for even, even the very best APTT reagents, some of those patients will have a normal APTT. So once again, we can't use a normal APTT to exclude the presence of such a problem. We should also keep in mind that the APTT is very much affected by the level of factor eight. So if we have a mild haemophilia B patient who's unwell, sick, acute phase response, marked elevation in factor eight, three, four, five times normal, 300, 400, 500 units per deciliter, that compensates during the test. So even though the factor nine is 20, 15, units per deciliter, there could well be a normal APTT as a consequence of this marked elevation in factor eight. This absolutely occurs from time to time. And the same problem occurs with factor 11. Mild deficiency, masked by acute phase response, high level of factor eight. So again, we have, we have to be careful not to overinterpret APTT. So this is patient number two now, second reagent. Remember with the first reagent, 116, 113 seconds, pretty grossly prolonged. This showed an excellent correction. Reagent number one, 50-50, normal mix, it corrected to 36. So highly likely to be a deficiency from that. Now with the second reagent, remember it's a different reference range. Grossly, grossly prolonged. 93 seconds, 91. Oops. Grossly prolonged with both reagents. Suggestive of a, a pretty marked deficiency. Very good correction, also suggestive of a marked deficiency. This patient has severe haemophilia A. Complete absence, less than one international unit per deciliter factor eight. Essentially no factor eight. Still clots, I think you know this, but it's a gross, gross prolongation, both with, with both reagents. Not, not the same time, but a gross prolongation. And so that's typical of severe haemophilia A, typical of severe haemophilia B. We expect to see gross prolongation, we will see gross prolongation, irrespective of reagent. Not the same numbers, that depends on the reagent. Okay, patient number three. So a number of situations where we can't use normal APTT to exclude mild bleeding disorders. I think that's an, it's an important limitation. How common are those kind of defects that I mentioned in relation to mild haemophilia A, normal APTT despite presence of mild haemophilia A, how common? Well, there are studies from our own centre in Sheffield which suggests about 5 to 10% of subjects who have mild haemophilia A would have this pattern, about 5 to 10%. And that's a very similar um, occurrence to the data published from an Aust some Australian group. They've also described this problem in about 5 to 10% of their patients with undoubted mild haemophilia. So it's not, just the, it's not just a UK issue, it occurs in other areas. There are um, similar reports uh, from, from, from other areas, so I'm convinced this is a, this is a problem that's um, prevalent in a, in a number of populations. We don't yet know if it's there in, in all populations worldwide. This is patient number three. Remember this was the uh, patient with 75, 76 seconds, pretty gross prolongation, not as marked as um, patient number two, but gross prolongation with the first reagent. First reagent, low phospholipid concentration, silica activator. When we did the correction, 50-50 mix, first reagent, 59, 60 seconds. So still grossly prolonged. So this is the one where we thought we're pretty confident there's an inhibitor present. We're pretty confident this 
is an immediate acting inhibitor. Made the mix, did the test, still grossly prolonged. A little bit shorter, but some dilution. So consistent with lupus anticoagulant, certainly an immediate acting inhibitor. Now finishing the APTTs with the secondary agent for number three, 35 seconds. Reagent number two, remember, this was the very high phospholipid reagent. Upper limit of normal, around 29. This was a patient in which the APTT with the first reagent, 76 seconds, gross, gross prolongation, very poor correction, 5960 on the 50-50 mix, immediate acting inhibitor. Now we've got further confirmation. APTT with this second reagent, very high phospholipid, very insensitive to lupus anticoagulant, much, much le less effect because of the high phospholipid, and a result close to normal, 35. Sometimes with this reagent you will get a normal result, sometimes there will be some mild prolongation as there is in this case, but you can see a marked, marked difference. 75, 35, big difference. That's, that's a feature of lupus anticoagulant. So you're not surprised to hear that sample number three is from a patient with a, quite a strong lupus anticoagulant from my centre. It's a sample that we uh, distributed through proficiency testing uh, programmes and showed a, a strong positivity with the specific tests and, and prolonged APTTs with the vast majority of reagents. Normal APTTs, or close to normal, only those few reagents with very high phospholipid. This is a patient with lupus anticoagulant. This is a typical pattern. Secondary agent, sample number four. APTT, 110 seconds. Gross prolongation. Now just remember sample number four. And we did this with the first reagent, low phospholipid, 140. Intermediate correction, came back to 46. Not back to normal. Consistent with what could be a time-dependent inhibitor. It's not typical of lupus anticoagulant. Here we are, second reagent, high phospholipid concentration, 110 seconds, gross prolongation. Not lupus anticoagulant. Highly suggestive of a time-dependent inhibitor. Actually, this is a severe haemophiliac, congenital haemophilia, a patient who developed an antibody following replacement therapy. Congenital haemophilia, antibody secondary to therapy. And that's a fairly typical pattern. If we had incubated that mixture in the water bath, one hour, two hour, we would have seen that 46 seconds increasing 70, 80, 90 seconds over time. That's a classical picture in relation to uh, congenital haemophilia with, with an antibody. And that's a patient where we would um, make the specific inhibitor test in order to uh, quantify the antibody. It's important to know the concentration. A few final comments about APTT that we uh, did not yet get a chance to make. Another variation between reagents is in relation to factor 12 deficiency. Factor 12 deficiency not associated with bleeding relatively common amongst hospital populations, at least uh, mild deficiency. And this can impact, this can prolong the APTT with some reagents um, more than with others. So the detection rate or the, de the number of such samples with prolonged APTT, that, that also varies a little bit between reagents. If, if we are a centre who is using APTT for heparin dosage assessment, in addition to bleeding disorder work, and uh, as I mentioned, that's I think very frequently the case for many of us, then we really must pay attention to the different heparin sensitivities. It's important to establish a reagent specific therapeutic range and there are publications and guidelines which, which advise us on how to do this. There's a UK guideline from BCSH and there are international guidelines also on publications. Um, so we have to keep in mind that we will expect to see very different therapeutic ranges according to different APTT reagents. So I think that's also important to keep in mind. Uh, we mentioned already um, precalicrine deficiency, high molecular weight kininergin deficiency. We can also see differences between results with different reagents. So we've spent some considerable time discussing APTT. Thank you for your patience. I think it's 
we've done that because it's a really important test and it's absolutely essential that we understand, those of us working with this method, it's absolutely essential that we understand all the detail of the method that we're using. What, what, what's its limitations? What will it tell us? What are the likely pattern of results? How, how to interpret those? And again, I would refer you back to the WFH laboratory manual, where, where we go into some more detail about this, and, 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 and there's some uh, important information also contained within this. Mm -hmm.